on behalf of myself and Dr. Sachdeva, we bring to you a summary of an uncommon operation named cervical exenteration. We have no relevant financial disclosures regarding this presentation. Cervical exenteration is a radical procedure and, as many know, is uncommon for the treatment of locally invasive cancers of the trachea, esophagus, or thyroid, as well as recurrent tumors at the site of a tracheal stoma and occasionally for benign disease. This radical procedure is often employed for cure but can be considered for palliation. It includes resection of tumors of the upper aerodigestive tract or thyroid that invades local structures such as adenocystic carcinoma of the trachea, cervical or hypopharyngeal carcinoma invading the upper trachea, invasive thyroid cancer, anaplastic thyroid cancer, recurrent laryngeal cancer at the tracheal stoma, or as salvage therapy after definitive chemoradiotherapy for the more common tumors of the larynx and hypopharynx or cervical esophagus that have a squamous cell histology. One of the benign conditions that surgeons can consider is post-radiation stenosis of the larynx, pharynx, or cervical esophagus. When assessing patients for this relatively morbid procedure, the following preoperative evaluation should be considered. Aside from routine history and physical, endoscopic evaluation of the hypopharynx, cervical esophagus, and upper airway are critical. In the setting of malignancy, complete staging, CT chest, neck, potentially abdomen, and PET scan to evaluate the extent of disease and the feasibility of resection, including nodal status, degree of local invasion. Special attention to invasion into the cervical spine should be noted. When considering reconstructive options, one would have to prepare for the possibility of colon interposition, which may include the need for colonoscopy, mesenteric angiogram to define the vascular anatomy. One more important consideration is confirming an intact circle of Willis if there is planned to divide the innominate artery. It goes without saying that a formal functional assessment in these patients is mandatory since this is a relatively morbid procedure. Patients must have preserved cardiopulmonary function to tolerate uh, the level of invasiveness. A baseline neurologic exam is of critical importance since there may be a planned division of the innominate artery. If nutritional status is poor, one would have to consider placement of enteral access or temporary feeding tube to optimize a patient prior to considering cervical exenteration. The operative setup for cervical exenteration includes adequate venous access and an arterial line for hemodynamic monitoring. Patients are placed supine or often one arm is abducted. Airway control is often through an indwelling tracheostomy site or via the endotracheal route. When preparing for surgery and preparation, additional areas of sterilization should be included in anticipation of skin grafts or muscle flaps. The operation commences with a transverse incision above the sternal knots superior to the clavicular heads where a prior tracheostomy site may often be included. Skin with radiation injury is often included with the resection specimen. The neck is subsequently explored through this incision, carotid to carotid, including evaluation of the prevertebral fascia. The clavicular heads, first and second costal cartilages, are also often included in this resection. The inferior skin flap is elevated and the upper sternum is subsequently split, extending transversely over the second interspace to allow for complete mediastinal exploration. The thyroid is split medially and retracted laterally if not involved, otherwise resected with the specimen. Once the need for mediastinal tracheostomy is confirmed, removal of the 
bony plate, including sternum, clavicles, and first and second ribs, seen in the illustration, facilitates resection and allows for bipedicled skin flap to reach the trachea if necessary. The next challenge in the operation is resecting trachea with adequate margin and at the same time allowing for reconstruction of the tracheal stoma. When manipulating the trachea, cross-field ventilation can be performed. Tracheal re reconstruction options include cervical tracheostomy if there's adequate length or anterior mediastinal trach or tracheostomy. In most cases, division of the innominate artery proximal to the bifurcation is required to construct a mediastinal tracheostomy. Prior to dividing the innominate artery, one would have to confirm an intact circle of Willis during the preoperative evaluation and in addition incorporate a test clamp of about 20 minutes while implementing intraoperative EEG. If there is significant stress on EEG, division of the innominate artery should be avoided. The alternative is transposition of the tracheal stump infralateral to the innominate artery, which we would describe later. If it appears that there is excessive tension or pressure on the innominate artery, the artery can be divided after an occlusion trial, as I mentioned, with intraoperative EEG monitoring. The omentum or perhaps pectoralis muscle flap can be used to protect the divided ends of the innominate artery and thus avoid fistula to the innominate stump. The tracheostoma can then be brought through a bipedicled anterior cutaneous flap. This may require split thickness skin graft from a left thigh as a donor site. If there is tension on the innominate artery, the alternative to division is to transpose the end of the trachea. This was described by Mark Oringer in 1979. The notion is to develop a space beneath and to the right of the innominate artery and vein and to transpose the tracheal stump to a position to the right of the innominate artery as mentioned. This permits one and a half to two centimeter additional length to be brought out to the mediastinum. The defect can then be reconstructed where the stoma is brought through a thoracochromial or nipple flap as seen in the picture. The skin and the subcutaneous tissue is rotated off the pectoralis muscle superiorly and the inferior defect is reconstructed with a split thickness skin graft from the thigh. Initial success with this technique required at least five centimeters of trachea, but subsequent success has been reported with shorter tracheal stumps. The second component of this cervical exaggeration includes management of the hypopharynx and esophagus. If there is no involvement of the cervical esophagus, which is often not the case, then uh, it can be left intact. If there is minimal involvement of the cervical esophagus, a partial resection with primary repair may be achieved. If there is extensive involvement, one would have to consider partial esophagectomy with a reconstruction such as radial forearm free flap or jejunal free flap or total esophagectomy with reconstructions that might include a gastric conduit pull-up or colon interposition. As mentioned, reconstruction options for total esophagectomy include stomach or colon, segmental resection of the hypopharynx or cervical esophagus may be amenable to pedicled vascular flaps including jejunum or radial forearm free flap or even a uh, vascularized myocutaneous pectoralis flap. The postoperative care of these patients is critical. Given the extent of the resection and the notion of having a mediastinal tracheal stoma, patients should be initially managed in an intensive care setting. We often place a nasogastric tube to stent the anastomosis and leave it in place to prevent flow of gastric secretions into the mediastinal tracheostomy. These patients will all need enteral access and placement of a 
uh, jejunostomy is of critical importance. In addition, multiple drains are placed underneath skin flaps uh, to avoid subcutaneous seromas or hematomas. These drains are then subsequently removed sequentially upon achieving minimal drainage. This operation can be associated with high morbidity and mortality. We have listed the various complications in this slide, some of which are devastating. Cerebrovascular accident after anomalous artery ligation is obviously incredibly morbid, where prevention is critical. The preoperative evaluation of an intact circle of Willis and the intraoperative clamp trial become critical when considering this part of the operation. Since most of these patients have radiated fields, anastomotic leaks are relatively common, particularly from the pharyngeal anastomosis. This is why we often recommend using a myocutaneous flap or even omentum to cover the pharyngeal anastomosis and provide vascularized tissue in case of a leak. Flat necrosis of reconstructed conduits is a major complication and requires debridement and removal of devascularized tissue. Hypothyroidism, hypoparathyroidism can be followed rather easily with serum assays. A chyle leak uh, can be seen and if it's identified should be intervened upon rather quickly. The mortality in this operation can be as high as 18 percent. Morbidity marked by the complications in the previous slide can be seen in up to two-thirds of patients. In patients who survive the initial post-operative insult, results are similar to total laryngectomy, where we can see good function with adequate oral intake. The esophageal reconstructions can require dilations and rarely stenting. There are some need for revision of tracheal stoma or dilation. The use of an electronic larynx or functional esophageal gastric speech is clearly a good option for these patients. Long-term survival depends on the underlying neoplastic disease where most are due to systemic recurrence of metastatic disease. Here we depict one of the novel developments in a reconstruction technique which includes a cryopreserved aortic homograft. This technique was published in the Annals of Otorhinolaryngology in 2012, where authors included Stephen Zytel's and colleagues from the Massachusetts General Hospital. In the first panel, uh, one could see a partial esophagectomy specimen with a partial laryngectomy. In the third panel, the resected anterior esophagus is visible where you're looking into a luminal surface. And in the fourth panel, the aortic homograph is sewn as an onlay over a silastic tube to reconstruct the esophagus period. The results of this aortic homograph have been rather good, and we've used it for partial or segmental resections of the pharynx. This novel technique uh, can be considered for 
partial resections when uh, local tissue options or transfer of vasculite pedicles are limited. This concludes the review of cervical exoneration. We have listed a, a few selected references. Again, this operation is an uncommon operation and teaching it to residents has become challenging.